Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us to learn about the state of the Docker engine. Our speaker today is Monik Taneja. He's a senior product manager at Docker, and he's responsible for pretty much everything Docker engine. That includes ContainerD, uh, Docker Community Engine, and Docker Enterprise Engine. Uh, Monik joins us with over 10 years of experience in cloud, data center, IoT, and the open source world. And I also understand you're a bit of a foodie, which means you're probably enjoying your stay quite a bit here in Barcelona. Oh, definitely. I think um, I think Spain is a dream come true for anybody interested in food. So thank you for having me here. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, welcome, everybody. Good evening. Um, I know it's uh, late in the evening. I know you guys are all thinking about food. I know I would be, <laughs> given I'm in Barcelona. But um, I promise to keep the session entertaining, give you a deep dive on where we stand with respect to Engine, um, and really sort of uh, walk through some of the recent announcements we have made around the new features in Engine and um, give you a lay of the land on where we stand. So let's get started. I mean, I want to start with like, why are we here, right? Like we are here because of Docker Engine. Like that's what started it all. The revolution in software development, the excitement with a new paradigm in how we want to approach software itself and manage its life cycle. So from the last five years to today, we have had an amazing, amazing journey from sort of starting with nothing to being at a point where we have like 8 million active engines on a regular basis, on a monthly basis, right? And that number is only expanding. And, that, and those 8 million engines are now sort of helping us drive the growth of software and its consumption with like 75 billion almost uh, image downloads from the hub. And to, to go a little bit like further into what's driving the agenda today. We're going to be starting with the Docker engine architecture, understand how that has evolved um, over the five years, look at what will happen um, with respect to now ContainerD getting inserted into the, into the engine. Uh, we will review the latest features in uh, Docker engine 1809, which is the latest release as of early November. Uh, cover some of the changes between the Docker Community Engine and the Docker Enterprise Engine. And then follow that up with uh, some of the exclusive features that we are offering now for the Docker Enterprise Engine, uh, particularly around Windows, and review what we are planning in the future. So I'll be taking questions at the end, so feel free to um, you know um, ask me questions if you have. So deep diving into the engine architecture, um, this is what the engine sort of looks like today. At the bottom of the stack, we have uh, what we call as Run C. Uh, Run C is nothing but a single shot container executioner, right? It is not managing the life cycle of multiple, multiple containers. It is only and only responsible for the lowest level of container execution. So setting up your C groups, setting up namespaces, dealing with Linux security modules, whether it be App Armor or SE Linux, right? But it only manages a single container and then it exits, right? So it does not prolong after the life of whatever the task it is supposed to be doing is done. Right, that's the sort of bottom of the stack when it comes to engine architecture. If we go one level above that, we have ContainerD, which is our minimal container runtime. So ContainerD's job is to essentially fill in all the gaps left behind by Run C, right? So ContainerD can now come in and manage lifecycle for multiple containers at the same time, right? So um, whether it is the exit signal of a container or a out of memory notification, ContainerD can handle those messages on an individual container basis and manage the life cycle of all those containers through their journey, right? We're going to go uh, into a little bit more deeper depth into ContainerD in just the next slide. So we couple all of this together uh, with Docker D which is sort of the simplistic Docker experience that we want to offer our users, our customers, our developers, 
uh, uh, the ops teams. And these include additional things above and beyond just the running of containers itself. This could be building, this could be logs management, this could be um, secrets management to ensure uh, Docker Trust, for example. This could be the image push and pull capabilities. So the entire gamut of activities that we want to do with respect to a container are bundled on top with the addition of Docker D itself, right? And together, all of these pieces, run C, container D, Docker D, they comprise what we call as our Docker community engine, right? Docker community engine is the de facto gold standard for developing containers and doing everything for the life cycle of each of those containers, right? So when we go from community edition to the enterprise edition, the biggest difference is now we are looking at the ops teams who have chosen to develop on the Docker platform and deploy on it, right? So we add sort of um, primitives around security, primitives around FIPS certification for compliance purposes, and roll that up with um, business day or business critical support as well as any certified plugins or ISV containers that can then be deployed on the Docker Enterprise platform. On the side, we have um, Docker Compose, and which is our sort of uh, prescriptive way to manage the lifecycle of um, uh, applications and services um, on top of containers, which is then um, added in as an additional component on top of the engine, whether it be uh, the community engine or the enterprise engine. Going further, if we take a deeper dive into what is Container D doing by itself, right? So Container D has evolved in the last, uh, I'd say two years. It started its journey as a minimal container runtime, like I was saying, around the time of Swarm. Um, it was really hard to wrap Docker itself to make Swarm consume Docker as an orchestrator, right? So we started by defining a very minimal scope of things that should all be packaged together to make the experience of containers or executing containers, which is what an orchestrator really needs. So there are three things that Containity does, right? So there's container execution, number two is image management, and number three is setting up the union mount file system, right? So if we dig a little bit deeper into what those primitives actually mean with respect to a container. So container execution is only responsible for the four primitives, create, start, stop, and delete, right? We have image management, which is concerned with push and pull. And then we have the container file system itself, which is responsible for setting up the various layers in the uh, union mount file system so a container can actually exist, it can see all the directories and it can see all the information it needs to actually operate upon. And if we move on to what are the new features in terms of like Docker engine, um, we have now merged Containerd 1.2. We have brought feature parity in all things Containerd 1.2 back into the Docker engine, right? We have added building block changes to include support for build kit. Um, we have added support for CE to E activation, which we're going to look in just a little bit further. And then we have also added additional support for a new runtime shim within Containerd to allow different runtimes to get plugged in, um, which we'll see just a little bit later. So Containerd has been seeing tremendous, tremendous growth um, it is part of the CNCF Foundation as a top-level project, and at this time, as we speak, it is moving closer and closer to graduation, right? We hope um, to have that publicly available very, very soon. So what do these features and capabilities by merging Containerd actually bring, right? So um, these are some of the things that BuildKit has now been able to deliver with the engine itself, right? So there's tremendous amount of performance improvements. 
And how did we achieve that? By essentially having a new architecture around concurrency and caching, right? So we can do build stages in parallel. We don't have to do one by one by one. We can skip unused stages, so if there are no changes in a stage, there is no need to execute that stage anymore. So we can um, unused context files, like we don't need to use them. Whether there is um, context transfers, so up until now, before BuildKit, for example, um, everything that a container needs for its build lifecycle is transferred back to the Docker daemon, and the Docker daemon rebuilds everything in every stage even though there may be minimal changes to only parts of what you need to actually build, right? So in this case, you can only transmit the diff of what those changes are from the client, which is the Docker CLI, for example, or some other tool that is actually calling the Docker API to the Docker daemon and only build the relevant parts that have since changed, right? So tremendous uh, reduction in the time by not having to constantly upload all the data back to the daemon, right? Especially if you are connecting to a remote daemon, not on your machine, right? Or in a build farm, imagine the kind of uh, latency improvements that you will be able to see. We also have support for build time secrets. So prior to um, Docker Engine 18 or 9, um, the only way to actually provide secrets in Docker files were to actually copy the secrets or provide them as environment variables. Either way, you're essentially creating a big problem because um, those secrets are now available in the cluster, right? Those are your personal secrets that you're actually using um, to build, uh, build a container. So in this case, now you have an option as part of Docker build, you can specify dash dash secrets and be able to only provide secrets um, to the container at build time when needed, and those secrets are written in tempfs, they are never stored in the container, allowing you um, complete privileges uh, um, on the container and not revealing secrets to the rest of the, the rest of the cluster. We have also added support for SSH forwarding, so um, imagine if you were um, cloning a private Git repository, right? Um, you don't have to essentially um, put your SSH keys as part of the Docker file. Um, you can essentially, again, like you can pass an argument, docker build dash dash uh, SSH, and essentially it'll forward your local SSH agent um, to Docker D so it can um, actually use those privileges to retrieve information, whether that be, like I was saying, a Git repo, or it could be a S3, S3 bucket that actually has the information um, for you to actually build from. There's also feature parity for the builder, right, with the old builder. So everything that was available in existing Docker files will work seamlessly with the new build kit, right? So there's no loss of features. Um, there's some changes with respect to UX, uh, which we'll see in just a second. Um, but those changes um, are actually there to make the experience uh, a lot better. So you will see. And then we are also providing the ability to now extend a Docker file, right? So previously, if you wanted any new features in the Docker file, um, you had to actually submit PRs. But now um, you can actually write your own custom front end that can read what is in the Docker file, convert it appropriately to Docker runtime objects, and provide them to build to actually execute them. So it follows the hash syntax directive right at the bottom. And uh, if we look at uh, the enablement for buildkit itself, it's really simple. You can just say docker buildkit equal to one or make that a um, global, um, global configuration as part of your daemon.json. So in this example, you can see uh, build times for all the stages, which are all happening in parallel. Right, so you're not doing one stage after another. Um, you can actually see um, that diff of the information is being transferred as needed as part of the um, transferring context um, page here. Um, and then, of course, um, these uh, all this information is there to actually clearly specify what stages are getting built at any time, how much time is it taking in every stage, so you can optimize your um, Docker files and take advantage of all the features in build, right? So 
On, on this front, actually, I have a question here. How many people here have build farms on-prem, in the cloud? Hands up. All right, right on. So, I mean, imagine all the changes that have happened in BuildKit tremendously reduce the time that it takes to do builds, right, and time's money. So if you compare um, the savings across the board for any organization, they are really tremendous. And, and because of that, I want to highly, highly encourage everybody here to review two sessions by my colleagues. Uh, one of them is right after my talk on Dockerfile best practices. You will be learning um, all the enhancements um, that have been introduced as part of 1809, some of which I discussed a moment ago. And then, of course, there's the talk tomorrow on supercharged Docker build with BuildKit that goes into, um, that's a black belt level talk that goes into details um, into how these features were implemented, why those design decisions were taken, how did we get here where we are, and sort of provide you an opportunity to contribute back um, with your own ideas and enable you to move forward with Docker. The next thing I wanted to cover is uh, support for SSH connections. So historically, if you ever wanted to connect to a remote Docker daemon, the only way to do that was over plain text or TLS, right? So um, I don't know if anybody has tried setting up TLS, but it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> it's a lot of work. You have to manage certificates. You have to generate them. You have to put them in appropriate places. So um, we now have support for just standard SSH, uh, nothing to be done, just connect directly to any host, wherever you need it to be. We have also introduced support for Compose on Kubernetes. So um, Kubernetes was actually introduced in the Docker platform um, earlier this year in April as part of the Enterprise Edition 2.0 release, right? And uh, the primitive that Docker has offered to manage the life cycle of a service is Compose. And so to make everybody's life easier so people don't have to learn new primitives, whether it be Helm or some other pack or QBAML, um, you can continue to use and develop using Compose. And we have actually built a um, controller that actually takes those commands that are written in Compose, converts them to Kubernetes native objects, and deploys the, the service on a Kubernetes cluster, uh, wherever that might be. So we'll be um, discussing uh, some open source aspects uh, for, for the Compose controller as part of our keynote tomorrow, so please stay tuned in. Um, but imagine not having to um, worry whether you're actually deploying to Swarm or Kubernetes and be able to seamlessly hop between both of them uh, using UCP. So uh, a single way to deploy to both Swarm or Kubernetes at the same time. We have also, as of, uh, I believe, DockerCon Austin last year, uh, moved from our sort of versioning scheme of like 1.0, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13 to the split between Docker community and the Docker Enterprise Engine. So. In this section, I want to sort of give a little bit of a deeper dive into what that means for everybody, what features have we introduced, and uh, why are we doing that. So to start with, I want to talk about the release cadence. Uh, as of today, we have a six-monthly release cycle. Right? We have community engine and the enterprise engine lining up for GA at the exact same time. Uh, we just released the 1809 release for both Community Engine and Enterprise Engine as of early November, and uh, then we will have a, a next CE and uh, Community Engine and Enterprise Engine release around March, April timeframe in uh, 2019, next year, and so on and so forth. So we have a six monthly release cadence. Each release for Community Engine is supported for uh, one month after the next release, so given the six month cycle, uh, you go from one CE uh, release to another uh, for a supported period of seven months. And during that time, we do all the backports, all the security fixes, and allow you to use Community Engine wherever you like, right? Um, 
and then we have the Enterprise Edition release, which is now supported for essentially two years. So if we do a little bit deeper dive into what that support model looks like, um, so from um, zero to, to 12 months, or GA to 12 months, we will provide fixes for break fixes, troubleshooting support, RCA support for urgent, um, sub zero and CVE issues, right? So any security issues, any sub zero or sub one issues, we will provide patches, backports uh, for the first 12 months after GA. For a period from 13 to 18 months, we will only issue patches for sub zero as well as critical issues. And from month 19 to 24, we will be seeing patches for security issues only though we will be helping uh, with RCA still. So with that defined, I think it's a, it's a good moment to look at what are some of the changes between the enterprise and the community edition release, right? So um, we have enterprise class support for defined SLAs, whether you can choose between business day or business critical uh, versus community support in the Docker community engine. Uh, you have seven months of maintenance uh, like I just discussed, and of course there's the uh, option to work with the community in defining the roadmap and what does the future of Docker Engine looks like. Right? On the enterprise side, um, you work with the product teams um, where we actively um, work with you to understand what your requirements are, um, prioritize them, and um, put them up in the roadmap for delivery. Um, we add all of these things with some key features that we are now targeting uh, for the ops teams who have started deploying uh, Docker Engine in production, right? We have like around 600 customers as of this moment. So uh, some of those things include uh, the FIPS certification, FIPS 140-2. Um, there is the option to use the certified plugins that are fully supported by Docker and the ISV, who is providing the plugin and the container. There's the option to use Docker logs for all logging drivers. Um, there's the additional testing above and beyond uh, what we do on the community engine front with um, scalability testing, uh, stress testing, and longevity testing. There's also the ability to use Compose on Kubernetes, as well as uh, Windows Server support, which are sort of um, exclusive features to the, to the Docker Engine Enterprise. So let's do a deeper dive into each of those features. On the Docker Engine Enterprise-only side, we. Uh, introduced earlier this year support for all logging drivers. So up until this moment, the, the design pattern for accessing logs has been to just log to the JSON file and then have an out of bind process that reads the Docker logs and then transmits it to your logging solution, wherever that might be, Splunk, AWS, Datadog, uh, Sysdig, um, you name them, they, you can use whatever. So. The challenge with that has been that if you were to, for example, directly configure Docker to use a remote third-party driver, let us say AWS, then if you want to do local debugging on that node and you issue Docker logs for that container on that particular node, you won't see anything because all the logs are being sent remote all the way to AWS and nothing is on the system. So now we have introduced a new logging driver uh, it's called local, and essentially it serves as almost like a parallel proxy. Um, it receives a log file, oh, sorry, it receives a log request, and then in parallel it sends one to the remote driver and it sends a copy to the local file. Right? So the local file is described here uh, on my slide, and each container has its own log file. This is fully compressed and rotation is supported by default. Um, so you can essentially be sure that like, you can be logging remotely as well as locally without having to um, do gymnastics with um, like, you know, out of band um, processes that can actually process the logs. The next up is uh, FIPS validation. Um, before I get into this, I'm curious how many people here have uh, heard of FIPS before? All right, some, maybe 40%. So maybe I start with like uh, FIPS 101. So FIPS is essentially the Federal Information Processing Standard, which is designed um, and defined by the US government as part of its uh, National Institute in Standards and Technology body. Um, it defines a set of cryptographic ciphers that any piece of software should use 
in order for that software um, to be used in um, highly regulated environments such as uh, federal space, uh, finance, uh, medical, or, uh, or any of the other regulatory bodies. So it's sort of becoming a de facto standard like other bodies such as PCI um, are also requesting usage of FIPS in these environments. Um, so we worked with third party accreditation labs in US and actually did a full validation of the cryptographic ciphers that we use in the engine. Where there were changes, we conformed to them by using the additional ciphers or different ciphers that are mandated as part of this requirement and uh, make sure that uh, we pass all the certification criteria. So as of the 1803 release earlier this year, we actually added Linux support and with 1809 today, we have full validation for both Linux and Windows, right? It's automatically enabled if you use a FIPS enabled OS. So if you were using, for example, RHEL uh, or Ubuntu or Windows um, and you enabled FIPS on the OS itself, FIPS mode on the Docker engine will pick it up and automatically enable it. So there's nothing to be done, right? So allowing you to meet uh, regulatory requirements if you have such needs. Moving on for uh, Docker Content Trust. So prior to 1809, we had the ability to set up a notary server to do signature scanning and verification uh, via notary uh, integration into Docker. But again, it was a real, real pain to manage because you had to do a lot of things to set up Notary, set up bindings from Docker-D to Notary, and make sure that Docker-D can actually process all of those bindings. So instead, we introduced a new primitive around Docker Trust, and the Docker Trust allows you to generate keys, it allows you to sign them, to manage their life cycle, to uh, revoke them if you need to be, and essentially be able to verify um, images and the integrity of those images before they are actually executed um, on a remote node, right? So imagine that uh, you are a developer, you're sitting, you're developing your Docker images, um, and then you push them to the registry um, without signing them, then there is no way to guarantee that when an image is executed, it is actually the right image that you specified, right? So to ward off against any man-in-the-middle attacks, you can essentially sign them at source and then distribute your image to whoever who so chooses, who can then consume the public in public key information for the repository that was used to, to develop that image and verify the signature chain from the source to deployment and make sure that you're only running verified content um, wherever that might be, whether it's in a local data center or it's an edge node somewhere in the middle of a desert, um, it doesn't matter. So it's essentially enabling the full uh, image verification from deployment, from development to deployment. We also integrate um, in the 1809 engine with a slew of um, additional software that we provide. So at the bottom of the stack, we have the Docker certified infrastructure. Docker certified infrastructure is nothing but um, our prescribed way to deploy Docker Enterprise Edition um, to a variety of platforms, whether it be on-prem or on the cloud, whether that's uh, AWS, Azure, VMware. Um, I think we support those three as a starting point. And then um, we're looking at adding support for GCP and IBM Cloud uh, and offer support for a variety of OSs whichever um, you prefer. And then we have support for certified plugins from a variety of vendors uh, for both storage and networking and logging. Um, and then on top of that, we have um, ad additional applications that are available via a support model that is jointly supported by both Docker and the, the partner themselves. Moving on to Docker on Windows, we have so far had support for Windows Server 2016. We had support for 1709 and 1803. More recently, we've been working very closely with Microsoft to develop support for Windows Server uh, 2019, which should be available soon. And as you can tell from, from the slide, like over those releases, 
we have been con consistently adding new and new capabilities. So like for example, image compatibility was a big problem with Windows Server 2016. If you look at the Windows version, you have major, minor, build, and revision. And all four of those, or the quartet, needed to match from the base server image to the container image, right? And that's a big challenge. So with uh, server 1709 and 1803, Microsoft has reduced that uh, verification. So you don't need to worry about revision and you can have a container-based image that uses a different or a newer revision, for example, versus the, the server image themselves. They have also made tremendous improvements with respect to image sizes, uh, reducing it from 420 megs to like about 140 megs right now. Um, in terms of networking, they have brought support for both host mode and DNS round robin, um, making it feature parity with like what's available on Linux. Um, add support for ingress networking and whip load balancing. And then, of course, there's the capability uh, for Kubernetes support on Windows, which was sort of in beta uh, in Q1.9, but the community is looking at bringing that to the market with 114 in uh, March, March 2019 timeframe. So we're looking to GA that in conjunction with Microsoft um, whenever that announcement happens most likely around uh, April next year. And so moving on to sort of the support life cycle, both um, the semi-annual channel as well as the long-term supported channel, uh, which are um, images that like Microsoft develops essentially every six months cadence uh, or two years, depending on the semi-annual or the LTS channel, uh, we will support all of those images by default and enable them for all Windows workloads. Moving on to specific uh, Windows features. So historically, um, there has been the capability to do Docker and Docker for a long time on Linux, right? But that was not available to Windows developers so far, right? With the 18.03 release, we have now enabled support for name pipe mounting. So you can essentially uh, be able to include the Docker a socket back into your application itself and be able to do any uh, primitives around Docker and Docker. So let's say you're building and you can also deploy within Docker on your own local machine and make sure that the work, um, how that container works and executes and does its life cycle is exactly the same as it would in production. So this is, uh, like I was saying, equivalent to what is available with Linux sockets already. Um, and then it's available for both process and Hyper-V isolated containers. So that's the um, Windows approach of using VM as an underlying primitive to run containers or running them natively in the Windows kernel. Moving on to uh, the future of what Docker engine looks like. So uh, before we get into the future, just like, where we stand today, like so we have um, Docker D at the top, like we saw earlier. Um, below that we have Container D, which is actually using the shim interface to communicate with Container D shim and actually launch Linux containers via Run C. Um, we are now going to essentially cut over uh, support for Windows, which actually existed uh, natively from Docker D directly to run HCS. Uh, that all that code, the spaghetti code, is being cleaned up. Um, that support is already in Container D. Um, and then we're going to essentially use the same interface to also launch Windows containers um, via Container D, communicating via the same shim interface for both Linux and Windows. We have also added support by working with the community to use different runtimes. So whether it be Kata or Gvisor, to launch VM-based containers or secure containers from Google, um, they are also utilizing the same shim interface as um, standard Linux and Windows containers. At the same time, uh, what we want to do and deliver, which I think is super, super useful um, for everybody here, is have the ability to manage Docker D itself with Container D just like any other container, right? So, Imagine 
having that capability delivered via a new process shim that can manage the life cycle of Dockerd itself. And why do we want to do that is to enable this paradigm, right? We want container DD to be the, the common boring software that does not change because the scope is so well defined that it doesn't need to do 10 million things all the things that are delivered on top of Containerd are actually the Docker experience. They are residing in a higher layer and having that lifecycle managed by Containerd essentially allows us to move from one version of Docker to another simply by using the same primitive as in like you deploy Container 1 and now you deploy Container V2. Similarly, you deploy Docker version 1 and then whenever a new update is available, you can just download that with Containerd and execute that um, and make sure that you can seamlessly go from one version of Docker to another. So to manage the upgrade lifecycle of the engine and in the future, <coughs> excuse me, the rest of the Docker platform, which will all be delivered uh, via containers. So that said, I think it's time to see for yourself how this actually looks like. So I'm going to show a quick demo on uh, some of the enterprise features and uh, how we can actually go from uh, community engine to enterprise engine. Um, can I just get a thumbs up in the back if you can uh, see the text, if you can read the text or? All right, perfect, thank you. So here I have a standard issue um, Ubuntu machine, if I, show you, uh, it's Ubuntu 16.04. I have Docker installed here, so I can see that it's uh, Docker Engine Community uh, version 18.09. What I want to do now is I want to actually activate to the Enterprise Engine. So let's start with logging in. So the idea with like logging in, we'll just see in, in a moment, is we have a new primitive now to do activation of the engine. And as we do this activation, it's actually communicating with the store, store.docker.com. It's looking up the ID that I specified with to log in, and it's checking against my ID to see if I have licenses associated against my ID. And in this case, it finds that there are no existing licenses. So it's giving me an opportunity to generate a trial license on the fly. In this case, I say yes, move ahead. So after it generates the trial license, it is actually going to look at what version of engine I'm consuming right now. And it's going to find the matching enterprise engine. So we were using 1809 engine. In this case, it has resolved that I was using 1809 it figured out what those bits were for the enterprise engine, it downloaded all those layers, and now it has successfully also set up my machine so I can actually consume the enterprise bits. So let's go ahead and do a restart. And as we do the restart, if I will review my Docker version again, you see that we have actually jumped from um, the community edition to the enterprise edition at the same version, right? But the real question still remains is like, why would I want to do that? So before um, I actually set up the demo, I have actually also set up my uh, daemon.json to actually enable Docker Content Trust. So remember the feature we were discussing earlier, the ability to verify the integrity of images from development all the way to deployment. So here I have set up my root key that actually is used, um, not the specific key, this is the ID of the key, that is used to actually sign images. And I already pushed uh, a signed image using my own repo. So let's try and pull that image. Uh, I'm just pushing a standard issue Alpine, and when I try to pull the Alpine image, maybe I can raise it up, you can see that there's no way to validate the trusted root capability for the signature verification on the standard um, official Alpine image versus if I pull a signed image, you 
then I can see that Docker engine is actually able to um, ensure that the metadata for that signed image corresponds to the root key that I have specified as part of my daemon.json configuration and is actually able to pull the image. So if we go ahead, we can even run this image. Um, one. And if I go inside the container, I can see that is standard issue Alpine 3.8. Right, so compared to the official Alpine, which is not signed, um, all those images cannot run. So moving back to our demo, um, in terms of like call to action, I would really request everybody to go to playwithdocker.com. We have a lot of content um, at each level, beginner, intermediate, advanced, step-by-step um, -step instructions to help you learn Docker and progress in your journey. Uh, we encourage everybody to download the Docker Community Engine, and then if you like to play with the enterprise features, please enable um, and activate to the enterprise engine. Everybody can get a free license, uh, and you will be able to try all the features for 30 days. Uh, so some public service announcements, um, and this is for me particularly, um, please log into your apps, Please give some feedback. Please help us uh, move forward. And then um, please join us in San Francisco for the next DockerCon from April 29th to May 2nd. And with that, I want to thank you uh, for being here. I will take any questions. And uh, um, feel free to join me um, in the hallway tracks and continue this conversation forward. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Monik. That was awesome. That was great. We, we are officially out of time, so if you have questions, just come on up to the front, and Monica can handle those face-to-face. -face. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you.